हरि ओम ओम तामेव माता च पिता तामेव तामेव बंधु च सखा तामेव तामेव विद्या द्रविनम तामेव तामेव सर्वम मम देव देव ओ दवाक आवर लविंग मदर दवाक आवर कंपैशनेट फादर दवाक आवर ट्रू फ्रेंड एंड कंस्टेंट कंपैनियन दवाक आवर ओनली वेल्थ एंड दवाक आवर ओनली विजडम दवाक ऑल इन ऑल ओम शांति 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 पीस 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 वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग द टीचिंग्स ऑन द सर्मन ऑन द माउंट ब्लेसेड आर द पीस मेकर्स फॉर दे शैल बी कॉल्ड द चिल्ड्रन ऑफ गॉड there is a parallel passage in the in 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 one of the hindu scriptures which i shall quote to you in the bhagavatam he in whose heart god has become manifested brings peace and cheer and delight everywhere he goes you see one who has become a child of god God dwells in his heart. And wherever he goes, he spreads that joy that is in God. He doesn't have to preach, he doesn't have to talk. His very presence unfold that joy in everybody. You see each one of us is a child of god there is that divinity within us there is that peace that joy that love all within our hearts and only they remain covered hidden covered by dirt and dust but the presence and the association of those in whom that covering has lifted brings out that joy that peace that love that divinity that is within each one of us now this what i am telling you is not merely a theory i have seen it demonstrated so i'll mention some of the incidents in the from the life of my master there was one characteristic that everybody felt that wherever he would be going and living within a circle there would be a a time of festivity so just as on festive occasions your heart becomes lifted up elevated and you feel a joy a delight not something passive but something very tangible same way we all felt within that circle now how he was a peacemaker i'll give you some instances we have a large monastery in benaras and there is some there is a home of service there so young boys are recruited who want to devote their lives to the service of god and man and there were about 40 or 50 boys at the time and then in course of time they formed groups 
politics as it were entered into the monastery. And there was the desire for leadership. Then criticism, finding fault with people, with others. And so the whole atmosphere was completely spoiled. Then the secretary of the order came to enquire into the matter. And then he talked to the boys and found out the truth of the matter, who were the ones that were creating all the trouble. So he took down the names of those and then wrote a letter to Maharaj Swami Brahmananda, who was the president of the order, that I found out that these are the boys that are creating all the trouble and difficulty, and so they should be expelled from the order. And Maharaj in answer said, do not do anything, I am coming there. So he came to this monastery. Days passed away, there was no talk of what happened in the past or anything, who is, the, who is to be blamed or anything of the kind. He did not go into the inquiry about the matter, but he lived there. And all he wanted was for all the boys to come and sit by him and meditate. And thus, two months passed away, and then he left. And there was perfect harmony and reconciliation. And there was no mention of the trouble at all. Now, I'll tell you another incident where I was present. We first joined the monastery in the headquarters. And one day I was seated by Maharaj and Swami Premananda, who was another disciple of Ramakrishna, a great illumined soul. He came to Maharaj and said, Maharaj, I saw two boys fighting and they had fist fight even. And this must not happen in a monastery. You, you remember how we brothers lived, we never said a harsh word amongst one another. Now, these the boys are not fit to live monastic life. We must expel them. Then Maharaj said, Brother, they have come to you. Transform their lives. And then Swami Premananda, he was, you know, such an illumined soul. He said, Maharaj, you are right. I'll bring all the boys to you. You give them your touch. So he went and gathered all the Swamis and Brahmacharis and Novitiates and brought them to Maharaj. And you know, he stood in rows. And Maharaj in a high spiritual mood at the time, he was half, abs half conscious only. He was seated, but he was conscious. And then each one came and prostrated and he had his hand lifted just that way over the head. I cannot say what others felt, but I felt this way. A physical illustration I shall give. When it is very hot and you have walked in, in, uh, in, the, in a hot sun and your whole body burns, then you get a cool shower as there is that physical feeling. Same way there was a feeling that that such peace, such joy, such an upliftment he gave. And he gave that to each one. And there was no more any talk about quarrel or fight. So these are the real peacemakers because they are the children of God. Now, as I pointed out, that there is that real peace in your own heart. You know, we are all seeking for peace. But peace, not something that is, one may say, of the grave. Not that. But there is a positive delight that must come, positive joy that must come. And you see, by obtaining things, you do not get that. 
You know, we may think that if I find this person, or if I find this wealth, or if I find this object, which I lack, I shall be very happy and peaceful. But you see, if our happiness depends upon coming in contact with anything, it comes and it goes. You see, it is something that you have to feel that inside, and which feeling must continue all the time. And that's what we are all seeking. But we are seeking outside of ourselves by coming in contact with objects and things and persons. For instance, for instance, a person feels lonely. He may have every friend and relative. They all love him and everything, but still there will be that feeling of lon lonesomeness. It is natural because the until we have that real union with our real friend, that loneliness cannot go. And that real friend is seated within your own heart. Call that God or Brahman or Atman does not matter. And if you can reach him, then the sweetness that comes in your life is something that is abiding. And it is not something that is selfish again. That you have got it for yourself. It, everything is contagious. As disease is contagious, so health is contagious. And thoughts are contagious. Life is contagious. And so, wherever you go, you don't have to preach. You don't have to talk. But you lift up the consciousness of people wherever you go. And you give that joy, that delight to everybody. So we have to become children of God. Not that we are not children of God. But we have forgotten that we are children of God. And we have to realize that. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now before we can understand this, these passages, I must try to point out to you the difference of attitude of the spiritual aspirants and of the people of the world. As a general rule you find people of the world they try to show their best side. They are secretive about their own faults, their own weaknesses. And they keep them hidden. But when they are in society with people and dealing with people, they show their best side, their good front. For instance, you have all experience how for instance, two women. I give the illustration of women. Women will have to excuse me for that. But two women with dagger in their hearts. Talking to each other, smiling as if nothing has happened. You see, that's the general run of people. And then again, you see, gossiping is, is what I call chutney. Life becomes, you know, uh, seems very worth living if we can talk against people, find faults with others. You know, in a society, you meet two women or four women. Oh, men also do that. Uh, they, they, in their talk, if they can talk against somebody or... or uh, tell a nice story to show the weakness of others. 
You see, that is uh, very entertaining. That is the general run of people. But if you wish to be a spiritual aspirant, you have to change your whole attitude. The spiritual aspirant, in the first place, is very frank and sincere. Without frankness, without being sincere, it is not possible to grow spiritually. One time I asked a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Turiyananda, just before I came to this country, I asked him this question. What is religion? And his answer was, to make the heart and lips the same. That is religion. To be perfectly frank. But that doesn't mean that you'd hurt others by being frank. I'll come to that. Who can really become frank? Now, as the spiritual aspirant begins his life, naturally he is frank, he is sincere, he is earnest. He does not try to hide his faults. He is what he is. And everybody knows that. That is his attitude. And why? How does he take that attitude? He has no desire <coughs> to please the public. His one desire is to please the Lord. That is his one desire. He wants to be good in the sight of the Lord. That is his one desire in his heart. In this connection, I'll tell you a story. There was a young monk. You know, sometimes the monks wander about with no possession, and they are taken care of by the people. And this young monk was wandering about, and he got tired. And so there was a tree, nice shade, and he wanted to rest. And then he was stretching himself, and of course he had no pillows or, or, or bedding or anything of the kind. He had just one blanket with him. He spread the blanket, and then he found some bricks nearby, and he made pillows out of those bricks. And he was stretching himself, lying down. Now there were some women, all the time women come, you know. <laughs> some women going to fetch water from the river. And they saw this young monk lying, and so they began to talk. Look at that young monk. He has renounced everything, but he couldn't give up the idea of pillow. So he, he had to make some bricks his pillow. So this young monk thought within himself, now these women are right. I should not have pillows also. I must renounce them. <laughs> so he threw away the bricks. Then the same women were coming back and they watched, no pillow. And so they said, ah, look at the wounded vanity of this young monk. He felt insulted. And so the young monk thought within himself, if I do this, they will criticize me. If I do that, they will criticize me. What is the good of trying to please people? My aim must be to please the Lord. You see, that must be the attitude of a spiritual aspirant. Now, if you have that attitude, then there will come an earnest desire to overcome your weaknesses. You see, if you keep your weaknesses hiding, that doesn't help. But if they are open, Naturally, there will be every attempt in your life to overcome your weaknesses. So, if you want to please the Lord, if you make the attempt to please the Lord, you will find that your whole life becomes purified. Now the question arises, what should be the attitude 
when people revile you or persecute you, persecute you in spite of your goodness and righteousness. In fact, sometimes they will persecute you, persecute you because of your righteousness. You see, this world is a very funny world. Cannot stand the good, to see the good of others. So naturally, there will be that vilification. And as I said, people love to hear the worst of everybody. And so if somebody says something against another, he may be a holy man, he may be a Christ, but that will be accepted. Is 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 gossip. That gossip will be accepted as the gospel truth. And naturally, they will revile the man. Now, what should be our attitude? There again, you see, all the disciples of Ramakrishna, whenever they had any occasion. They would insist upon this truth. Do not react. Do not retaliate. If somebody speaks ill of you, if somebody hurts you, and then you want to hurt that person in return, then you become as wicked as the other fellow. You drag yourself to his lower level. So you will find in the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples this insistence upon do not react, do not retaliate, but pray. Pray for such people. But of course, this is the teaching to monks. And we find the, as I, in the very beginning, I pointed out that Sermon on the Mount contains the teachings, the highest teachings given to monks. Now for a householder, you see this res not resisting evil, not to retaliate, something we have to consider more carefully. There is a parable of Sri Ramakrishna which should apply and which should be the attitude of the householders. You have to protect yourself. There are situations that arise where you have to protect yourself. You have to defend yourself. So there is this parable and through this parable Sri Ramakrishna taught a wonderful truth. You see, there was a poisonous snake, a cobra, in the outskirt of a village. And he was so bad that nobody could pass by that road. And he killed many and nobody could do anything to this snake. One great sage, Narada, he was passing by. And the village, villagers came and said, don't go by that road. There is a poisonous snake, a venomous snake. And he will hurt you. And this holy man said, oh no, nobody can hurt me. So he was walking by. And this snake came. And this, this holy man knew some mystery or mystical formula. And so the snake becomes very calm and quiet. Then this Narada, the teacher, said, I'm going to initiate you into a mantra, into the holy name of God. You repeat this name of God and never hurt anybody. So the snake became the disciple and he went into his hole and would chant the name of the Lord and would not hurt anybody, but he had to go out to, to, for such a food. 
And then the boys saw that the snake was so quiet and calm. And so they began to throw stones at him first. And the snake would not do anything, would not retaliate. And then they were bold enough to get hold of the tail and hurt the snake in many ways. Snake never retaliated or anything. And then he would go into the hole and at night when nobody would be there, he would go out in search of food and come back and stay in his hole. But he became very weak and sick. Then after some time, again, this holy man came by the road and he inquired about the snake and the boys said, oh, he is dead. We do not see him anymore. And Narada said, no, he cannot die yet. He has to attain his illumination, the mantra, the holy name that I gave him. That has to come to its fulfillment. So he went and called for the snake and the snake came, you know, very slow. What happened to you? Why, why do you look so sick? I said, I can't remember, but I have been, I've been meditating and chanting the name of the Lord, what you asked me to do. Then Narada said, oh, you must have been hurt by these wicked boys. I said, oh, yes, 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 I remember. Uh, but, but you asked me not to hurt anybody in return. Then this Narada said, you fool. I asked you not to hurt, but did I ask you not to hiss? <laughs> and so, to live in the world, you have to have some protection. <clears throat> of course, ultimately, God is protecting you, that's true. But you know, we sometimes forget that. And so, in our practical behavior, sometimes we have to hiss. When necessary. But again, do not have any ill will towards anybody. Never have any ill will towards anybody. You know, as, as Jesus said, uh, be ex rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your, is your reward in heaven. Not that after you die and go to heaven, you will be rewarded. But this reward in heaven is immediate because heaven is within you. You will have such sweetness within yourself that you are rewarded. So pray, pray for others. Those who hurt you, those who have ill will towards you and people have. Don't you see how Christ was crucified? How Buddha was reviled? How Ramakrishna was considered as a madman? And people avoided them. Talking against them. So that will be done. But pray for them. See the life of Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Praying for them. In the life of Sri Ramakrishna, there is an, an incident which again shows something unique. He even would refuse to, to blame the other fellow. This happened. There was another, there was a priest in that temple where he was living who became very envious of Ramakrishna because Mathur Babu who was the head of that estate and the temple and a very rich man. He had such reverence and such love for Ramakrishna and he would do everything for Ramakrishna. And so this priest got envious. And he came to Ramakrishna and said, Now, tell me the magic. How you have, you have hypnotized this man. I want to know the secret. And Ramakrishna said, I no, don't know any hypnotism. I have not done anything. He just loves me. But this man would not believe in Ramakrishna. He, he was sure 
that Ramakrishna knew some magic. And some magic spell of Anmatul Babu he has, he has spread. So he was seeking for an opportunity to punish Ramakrishna. And one day Ramakrishna was in his room alone and completely absorbed in Samadhi. So he came into the room and gave him a good beating, kicked him until he fell down and blood came out. And then Sri Ramakrishna kept quiet, didn't tell anybody about the incident. And much later, oh, one day he mentioned that incident to Mathur Babu and Mathur Babu said, Father, why didn't you tell me? And he replied, what is there to tell you? It was my fault. I couldn't make that priest believe in my sincerity. He thought I was lying to him. He thought, he believed sincerely that I had some magic spell. I knew some magic spell. So how can I blame him? Of course, this is unique. Now, I'll quote to you from the Bhagavatam, one of the Hindu scriptures, the song of a mendicant. You see, the, this mendicant was tormented by people. And then he sang this song. Even if thou dost think another person is causing thee happiness or misery, thou art really neither happy nor wretched. For thou art the Atman, the changeless spirit. You see, as you find that sweetness in the Atman, in God, in Brahman, then there is neither happiness nor misery that can affect you from outside. Thy sense of happiness and misery is due to a false identification of thyself with the body which alone is subject to changes. Thyself is the real self in all. With whom shouldst thou be angry for causing pain if accidentally thou dost bite thy tongue with thy teeth? Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the salt of the earth. You know, that's what a teacher does. Give to the disciple faith in himself, confidence in himself. You see, it is very easy to denounce somebody by showing his weaknesses and faults. A great a, a, a teacher can, can see through you like a glass case. Don't be afraid. But he doesn't mind his weakness, your weaknesses at all. He knows human nature. But he sees the possibilities in you. How it is possible for you to overcome all your weaknesses and unfold the divinity that is within you. And that is the function of the teacher. So the first thing you find in all our stories or in all our scriptures, when the disciple approaches the teacher, coming as helpless, weak, helpless, the teacher brings out the strength in the disciple. Know you are strong. It is possible for you to find the highest. Ye are the salt of the earth. And the same truth you find in, in, in Christ as a teacher. He doesn't tell these people, you are sinners, you are wicked. He says, ye are the salt of the earth. But remember again where the savour of the salt comes, where from the savour of the salt comes. You see, he gives us self-confidence, faith in ourselves. But does that mean that we have to be vain and proud? 
Remember again the beatitude. Blessed are the meek. So these two teachings go together. And where is that strength? Where is that savor of God? How do we become the salt of the earth? In the confidence, in the Atman, faith in the Atman, in God within, that is your true self. And the teacher brings out that, that truth in you. You know, I remember one time, that was also just before I was coming to this country. I went to see for the last time a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Turiyananda. And he began to talk nice things about me. I got bored. And I said, but Swami, what you are talking is not true. I know myself. I have none of these qualities. Then he said, I won't translate that to you exactly, but uh, I will do it. Uh, he, in plain words, he, he said, shut up. <laughs> but in good language, I'd say, he said, keep quiet. What do you know about yourself? I see what you're going to unfold. And that is the truth with every one of us. That is the truth. You are the salt of the earth. There is the potential power in you to unfold that divinity. And you are going to do it. That's what the teacher points out. Now again, as I pointed out, that, that really the savor comes from God. And if the salt have lost his savor, that is, if you become proud and vain and not find your strength in the strength of the Atman or God, then you lose your savor. You become egotistic. So egotistic or vanity, that is not self-confidence. It is the confidence of the divinity, of the Atman within yourself. Then again, the teacher gives this self-confidence in us in order that we can strive, struggle to unfold that divinity or realize God. So with self-confidence, there has to come self-effort. That reminds me of a truth that my master told me. He said, you may have the, you have the grace of Guru, you have the grace of God, you have the grace of his devotees, but unless you get the grace of your own mind, you may be ruined. So what is this grace of the mind? We have to make some effort. Now again, you see, we may understand, we, we may have the understanding, we have the grace of God, grace of Guru. We may have all that understanding and we may also have some vague desire for God. But the desire to, to struggle does not come. The, in other words, the will to pray and meditate, the will to surrender ourselves to God, does not come. So you see again Sri Ramakrishna teaching this prayer. Pray that that will may come to you. Pray that you may desire for God. You see, if you have some understanding, of the purpose and goal of life. And if you do not struggle for that, they say you are a suicide. So you have to make some effort. And this is the truth that everyone, every spiritual aspirant 
who has struggled a little will tell you. If you take one step towards God, God comes down ten steps towards you. Make a little effort and you find the door is opening. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now here again we find a beautiful truth. Here I believe that Christ transmitted that illumination into the hearts of his disciples. You see, you can tell this because we know in the life of Ramakrishna how he gave that light, he gave that illumination by his very touch to his disciples. You know, it's if anybody considers that his avatar, for instance, if a Buddhist claims that Buddha is unique, or if Christian claims Christ is unique, they do not understand either Buddha or Christ. We can understand Buddha in the light of Christ and we can understand Christ in the light of Buddha. And then again we can understand these great teachers in the light of the life of Ramakrishna in our present age. And so I can, I believe it firmly that Christ, just by his touch, gave that illumination to his disciples. And so he says, ye are the light of the world. But do not hide this light in a bushel. You know, from the lives of the disciples of Ramakrishna again, I can understand. Sri Ramakrishna gave this illumination to his disciples and we find again these disciples struggling hard to reach that illumination. And then, you see, one time, one brother disciple asked Sri Brahmananda, my master, didn't Sri Ramakrishna give you everything? Why do you have to struggle again? He said, yes, he gave me the supreme truth, gave me the highest samadhi. No doubt. But I want to make that natural with me so that I can transmit that power to others also. You see, who can be a teacher? Only one who has that light within himself. Whenever there would be any spiritual teacher, Sri Ramakrishna would approach him and ask him, Do you have the divine commission? Have you the command of God to teach? You see, otherwise the teaching does not affect people because teaching is something that is transmitted. And there are two kinds of knowledge, lower and higher. Lower knowledge is you study science, scriptures, philosophy, theology, memorize your doctrines. That's one kind of knowledge what you call intellectual knowledge, gathering information in your brain. And you may be an encyclopedia, you may have the en encyclopedic knowledge, but that's no religion or spirituality. You may be just a baby in spiritual life. And another is the direct immediate experience of God. 
And it's only when you have the direct and immediate experience of God that you can teach religion. You take the life of Ramakrishna. He hardly knew to read and write. And yet, the greatest learned men of the age came and sat at his feet. And it is not only what he merely, not only what he talked, what he said, but he gave something. I have seen one disciple of Ramakrishna. You see, Sri Ramakrishna even knew how to read. He, I sign, he, at least he signed his name, I know. But this disciple did not, could not even sign his name, didn't know the alphabet. He came from the servant class and they had no education. And at one time, Sri Ramakrishna tried to teach him alphabet. And this boy couldn't pronounce the alphabet correctly. So he gave up the idea. Oh, you can't learn. Then at another time, Swamiji tried to teach him, Swami Vivekananda, and this Swami said, Ah, your guru couldn't do something and you think you can do. And I gave you this introduction in order to show you his wisdom. There was a passage in the Upanishads, which we could not understand by reading commentaries and explanations and everything. It still was vague and hazy to us. So he came to this Swami. And of course he didn't know Sanskrit. So he said, tell me in plain language what it states. <coughs> so he stated, translated to him in his language. And he kept quiet for a moment. And then he said, I have got it. And then with an illustration, he explained that to us, which made it so simple and clear. So it is, religion is not book learning. No, I don't have much time, but uh, I'd like to tell another story in this connection. You see, there was... Uh, a, a great scholar was crossing the river in a boat. And there were some ordinary folk in the boat as passengers. And this scholar began to show his learning to them. He asked them, have you studied logic? Have you studied Nyaya, Sankhya, Vedanta, and so on and so forth? They said, no, sir, we have not studied anything. Then suddenly there's arose a storm and the boat was about to be capsized and these people asked him, Sir, do you know how to swim? No. So goodbye to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it is that learning how to swim this ocean of worldliness. That is wisdom. And that's what we have to get. You know, one thing the West must learn. And that is this truth. That God is a reality. And you and I and everybody can see him, can know him, can talk to him, can become united with him. In this life, in this existence, we do not have to die to do that. You see, this post-mortem religion, heaven, forget about that. If there is God, I must know him, I must see him now, here and now. That must be. That, and that is the spirit of religion. So that is the one truth the West has to learn because you have been indoctrinized in a different way. That nobody can see God. You have to go to heaven, die and go to heaven. Why don't they commit suicide and reach God easily? 
No. God can be known and seen here and now and there is the fulfillment of the purpose of life and there comes the real sweetness and peace in life. Om Hari Om Om Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrittorma Amritangamaya Abir Abir Maithi Rudra Jatte Dakshinang Mukang Tatte Namang Pahinityam Om Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from death to immortality. Lead us from darkness to light. Light us through and through and guide us evermore with thy loving presence. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.